When it comes to the existence of the universe and the formation of the universe, there are still a lot of unresolved questions, a lot of mysteries that we just cannot explain. Some in regards to things like dark matter and dark energy, but some are even more fundamental. Why does universe even exist? Technically, because of the existence of what's known as antimatter, none of the physical matter inside the universe should even be possible. With the actual argument going something like this. We know that universe contains both matter and its opposite antimatter. The existence of antimatter was physically proven back in 1932. This is a very famous picture of the first ever positron. And we know that when matter collides with antimatter, it annihilates, creating nothing but energy. And so if that's the case, when the universe was just formed, it very likely possessed both matter and antimatter in equal amounts. And if that's the case, all of this matter and antimatter should have self-annihilated, basically forming nothing but energy. Yet we have things like planets and stars to provide the evidence of the opposite. For some reason, matter prevailed, antimatter did not. For some reason, one dominated the other. And this is actually one of the bigger mysteries in physics that is still completely unresolved. Although some of the modern theories propose that this is a type of a what's known as CP violation or violation of symmetry inside the particles, with one of the best explanations for this being a hypothetical, still undiscovered particle known as axion. It just so happens that this is also the same particle that might be responsible for the dark matter. Now that by itself has not been proven yet, but that's basically the idea here. Mysterious invisible particles potentially cause matter to be more prevalent than antimatter. But in order to basically solve these mysteries and to actually try to understand what's happening with the antimatter, a lot of scientists have been proposing different types of experiments. And one intriguing experiment that scientists wanted to conduct is to actually see if there is something called antigravity. Or basically, do antimatter particles experience gravity in the opposite way? Because if so, this actually changes everything. If for some reason antimatter feels antigravity, this can suddenly provide us with a lot of other explanations for why antimatter seems to be so rare and matter seems to be so common. The axions would no longer be required. Because if antimatter experiences antigravity, and if the positron is being pushed away by gravity instead of being pulled by it, this would explain how matter and antimatter got basically divided in the early universe. That way, in one side of the universe you would probably have a lot of matter, on the other side you would have a lot of antimatter. And since we know that particles and antiparticles mostly have the same properties except for their charge and a few quantum numbers, it means that they can actually create their own anti-gas, anti-stars, anti-planets, and potentially even anti-galaxies. So that explanation, assuming that antigravity is real for antiparticles, would imply that the entire part of the universe contains a lot of anti-galaxies and maybe even anti-life? Cool proposition, but requires some evidence. Which is exactly why this particular experiment has now been completed, providing definitive results, but also being one of the most complex physics experiments that humans have ever performed in the last decade or so. Observation of the effect of gravity on the motion of antimatter. Performed by the scientists from CERN, the largest particle accelerator, but inside a specially designed facility known as Alpha-G. Now this experiment is absolutely mind-blowing in terms of its complexity and in terms of what was achieved here and how it was achieved as well. But before I explain to you what's happening here, well, let's talk about some of the properties and the details of antimatter. Because it will help you understand what the scientists were trying to work with. So first of all, unlike regular matter, antimatter is exceptionally rare everywhere. Ever since the early experiments, if you were to add up all of the antimatter into one large chunk, we've only been able to produce a few nanograms. That's ridiculously small. Intriguingly, not so long ago, NASA discovered that quite a lot of antimatter is being produced in our atmosphere by a lot of different effects. One of them is obviously collision of cosmic particles with the upper atmosphere, but the other stranger effect comes from the lightning. Thousands of lightning strikes per day seem to produce gamma rays with very specific energies that can only be explained by the production of antimatter through the interaction of a gamma ray with another atom. And because we know that electron and positron production will always have the same energy, by detecting these coming from the upper atmosphere, we know that this is very likely produced by lightning and nothing else. Although here it's really only positrons, the antimatter of electron. 
Interestingly, quite a lot of antimatter is also probably stuck in the Van Allen's belts around planet Earth. And here it's most likely antiprotons. These are probably coming from the Sun. And so at least in theory, this is one of the sources we could use in the future to try to capture more antimatter. But I guess that's beside the point. The point is that there is always at least some of it around the planet at all times. But the artificial production of antimatter has mostly been done in particle accelerators and is usually very expensive and requires a lot of energy. And once it's produced, it's also very difficult to try to store it. Any collision with a normal particle will instantly annihilate it. Only extreme locations like black holes and neutron stars are able to preserve antimatter long term. Here on Earth though, the record for preservation of antihydrogen is approximately 17 minutes. Although antiprotons can be stored a little bit longer, in this case up to 400 days. It essentially involves a very complex device that traps the antiparticles using electromagnetic fields. Super expensive, lots of energy required. Which is why antimatter is technically the most expensive stuff on the planet. 25 billion dollars per gram. So thinking of a new business idea? Yeah, try antimatter. At the moment, in a fully operational facility that's producing millions of antiprotons per minute, it would actually take billions of years to produce a single gram of antihydrogen. So yeah, we're definitely not even close to being able to produce this stuff with more efficiency. Which is exactly why it's so difficult to perform experiments using antimatter and to try to learn more about it. It's just really hard to make it. But as I mentioned, it's absolutely important to study it if we want to understand the universe as a whole. What exactly happened here early on? And where exactly is all of the antimatter that was supposed to exist here as well? And so this recent experiment known as Anti-Hydrogen Laser Physics Apparatus, Alpha, is essentially a huge collaboration that's been running for several years, with a single purpose. Figure out if antimatter feels gravity or anti-gravity. But how do you actually do that? Well, you obviously lift it up and see if it goes up or down. Easy answer, right? But how exactly do you measure this with tiny tiny particles, especially if the force of gravity acting on a single particle is super super weak and difficult to measure? Unless you make some kind of a larger object out of these antiparticles, it will be difficult to measure if they're falling or going up. Yet this is precisely what the scientists have been doing here for the past few years. They basically created a bunch of hydrogen atoms and anti-hydrogen atoms and put them in a tube that you see right here. Inside this tube they would be trapped for a very long time and would essentially experience only two forces, electromagnetism trapping them and gravity that would naturally be pulling them down. First they did this with hydrogen atoms, discovering that in the process, roughly around 80% of hydrogen atoms would exit from the bottom, with about 20% exiting from the top. Makes sense, that's gravity at work. But now they had to do the same with anti-hydrogen. Once again, same particle, just different charge and a few other quantum qualities. And so here by measuring this over and over and over again for many 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 years, they started to discover that it looks like anti-hydrogen is doing the same. The vast majority of anti-hydrogen particles were mostly exiting from the bottom, not from the top. And there's really no other explanation here than basically gravity at work. Although I guess interestingly, the actual number was maybe a little bit lower. I think it's something like 76% going down and 24% going up. And so what exactly does this mean? Well, obviously first of all, it means that there is probably no anti-gravity, at least when it comes to antiparticles. They seem to still experience regular down-to-earth gravity. And because here the only thing that was actually changed was the magnetic field, it would be very difficult to explain this as anything but the gravity. But there's still a very slight chance that maybe because the results do not exactly match with normal hydrogen, for some reason, gravity might prefer matter over antimatter just a little bit more. Now these are just some preliminary discoveries and it doesn't actually mean anything yet. And to confirm this, these experiments would have to be repeated many 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 times. But if confirmed, it does suggest that maybe there is an explanation for why the universe is the way it is without the use of, for example, axions. And so maybe, for some reason, antimatter is just a little bit different in its interaction with normal gravity. But that's not something we can actually establish right now, because what we can establish is that no anti-gravity at all. Gravity seems to work on everything for as long as it's some kind of a particle, even if it seems to be antiparticle. It also confirms that, in theory, 
Antiparticles can feel gravity and combine into larger objects, even forming anti-galaxies. Anti-galaxies with pretty much exactly the same chemistry and physics as a regular galaxy as well. They would not look any different, but they might feel just a little bit less gravity based on these new experiments. With the only difference being that if they do collide with a normal galaxy, they will basically completely annihilate, producing nothing but energy. As far as I know, nothing like this has ever been seen from anywhere, so their existence is extremely unlikely, at least in the visible universe. But based on the results from this experiment, it still means that we kind of are back to not knowing why the universe exists, or to be more exact, why it's made out of regular matter, and what happened to all of the antimatter. It looks like maybe we do need axions after all. And as I mentioned in the beginning, axions, at least in theory, could explain dark matter as well. Some videos in the description talk a little bit more about all of this. So definitely a super cool experiment, a very important discovery, and a confirmation that maybe, at least for now, anti-gravity is possibly not real. Although we'll probably learn more as the experiment keeps going and as more details are revealed about the properties of antimatter. At least for now, this is just super cool. I mean, honestly, just look at the size of this thing. This was designed specifically to study antimatter. An absolutely enormous complex, and possibly our first step of finally being able to produce this stuff in much bigger quantities. But once something else comes out out of this, I'll follow this up with the next video. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who has learned about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership, or by buying a wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.